Chapter 15 Today's Agenda Today, capitalism is threatening to commodify ever more areas of social life, to penetrate ever further into the private recesses of our lives, and to efface personality, let alone individuality. Urbanisation is threatening to devour the city and countryside alike, leaving community and archaism. The state threatens to absorb the very notion of freedom itself, and this drive is undermining the biosphere at an appalling rate, with consequences that are potentially catastrophic for all complex life forms. At the same time, many of these institutions are exerting a strong inertial pull on political and social life that militates against radical change and that enmeshes people in existing institutions. The mass media sedate or transfix people into accepting their own domination and exploitation, diffusing their inclinations to become something more than docile consumers and passive, adaptive subjects of elite rule. Against the wide array of social forces that oppose radical change, men and women today will need a compelling motivation to undertake the social municipal revolution described in these pages and to create the society proposed by social ecology. What could induce them to work to recreate the political realm, democratise their municipalities and confederate them as a dual power against the state? Undoubtedly, the most important of their many possible motivations is that a rational anarchist society would provide conditions for the greatest possible human social freedom. The growing unfreedom and inequality in the world today may well propel people to rise up in outrage against the exploitation, domination and even enslavement, although the specific event that may induce them to do so is unforeseeable. The notion of being able to manage one's own affairs in community with one's fellow citizens has an enduring appeal even and especially in an era of growing powerlessness and deracination. Nor is it possible that the nation-state and the capitalist system can survive indefinitely, even as this system is widening the divisions between poor and rich around the world into a yawning chasm of inequality. It is also on a collision course with the biosphere. Capitalism's grow-or-die imperative, in particular, which seeks profit at the expense of all other considerations, stands radically at odds with the practical realities of interdependence and limit, both in social terms and in terms of the capacity of the planet to sustain life. Capitalism and the global ecology simply cannot coexist indefinitely. In the next century, global warming alone is expected to wreak havoc with the climate, causing rising sea levels, catastrophic weather extremes, epidemics of infectious diseases and diminished arable land and hence agricultural capacity. At the very least, hunger and disease will soar, while states will become even more authoritarian to repress social unrest. Increasingly, the choice seems clear. Either people will establish an ecological society, or else the underpinnings of society will collapse. The recovery of politics and citizenship is thus not only a precondition for a free society, it may very well be a precondition for our survival as a species. In effect, the ecological question demands a fundamental reconstruction of society. In recent years, this looming crisis has given rise to an ecological politics. As we have seen, the Green Parties that have been formed in many countries try to achieve their ecological and social goals by making use of statist institutions, but after only a few years were reduced to conventional bourgeois parties whose professional elites practice statecraft and support the very forces that are producing the ecological crisis, albeit with a greener veneer. But the Greens are the only most recent movement that has tried to realise radical left goals in the corridors of the nation-state. They were preceded, most notably, by the European Socialist Parties, based in an idealistic and principled movement that, a few generations ago, upheld a vision of a socialist society. Tragically, as the socialist movement was transformed into an assortment of conventional statist parties, 
its vision was eclipsed by the pragmatics of gaining, holding, and extending power in state offices. Now, despite their original emancipatory visions, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the Labour Party in Britain, the New Democratic Party in Canada, and the Socialist Party in France exhibit only superficial differences with their capitalist counterparts. A century of such defeats has dispiriting effects. Time wears expectations thin as one disappointment follows another. Talk of a new politics becomes unconvincing, especially when people who might be receptive to the idea have been led by bitter experience to conclude that such efforts mean nothing more than the creation of another mainstream party. In despair, they may decide to work incrementally in a movement to address a single issue. Yet the history of the left has shown that strictly single-issue movements are limited as well. To be sure, they have significance for protesting particular injustices, but the results they yield are minimal in proportion to the growing social and ecological changes that are necessary. Above all, they do not provide a programme for building the ongoing institutions that are necessary for the reconstruction of society nor have they consciously aimed to create a political arena in which democratic activities could become a permanent presence in everyday life. The lessons of a century of leftist activity, then, point to the conclusion that neither parliamentarism nor single-issue movements can fundamentally change society. Workers' control of factories, for its part, leads primarily to collectivised capitalist enterprise. What alternatives remain? Any political movement today that presents itself as a challenge to capitalism and the nation-state must be structured institutionally around the restoration of power to municipalities, that is, to their democratisation, radicalisation and confederation. Critics of libertarian municipalism have argued that the obstacles that stand in its way are insurmountable, especially the large size of many cities today. But if one is guided by this logic, one must conclude that the very existence of a given social condition means that it is immutable. The large size of many cities today is indeed a problem, but the very techniques that have produced these cities also make it possible to reduce them to a human scale and bring them into balance with the surrounding natural environment. Eliminating the obstacles that stand in the way of social change is part of the process. To assume that problems that exist today are unsolvable merely by virtue of their existence, is to surrender to them. The mere fact of existence could be used to justify acceptance of the state and capitalism, in which case left libertarians might as well give up trying to replace them and become social democrats or liberals. Capitalism will not provide its opponents with the popular democratic institutions they need to struggle against it. It will fight to the end to preserve itself, its social relations, and its state institutions, however much it may allow, or even welcome the efforts of reformers to improve it, in inverted commas, and render it palatable. If a revolutionary people are to gain emancipatory institutions, they must create them on their own initiative. If they have available vestigial institutions on which they can build, like town meetings and city councils, so much the better. If such institutions do not exist, then they must create them from whole cloth. The task is harder, but it still can be done. While emancipatory traditions are helpful, they alone should not determine whether a movement to create a rational society will exist. In any case, the initiative for social change lies with the movement. Although libertarian municipalism may seem utopian, the steps it advances are actually quite concrete. So, too, are the social problems that compel us to act. Global ecological breakdown is a problem that affects everyone, regardless of class, and the desire to preserve the biosphere is universal among most rational people. The need for community is abiding in the human spirit, welling up repeatedly over the centuries, especially in times of social crisis. As for the market economy, let us recall that it is only two centuries old, in the mixed economy that preceded it, acquisitive desires were culturally restrained 
and many alternatives existed to modern capitalism. What men and women have created in past centuries can certainly be recovered and advanced by people today. If our ancestors, with their limited technological and communication resources, were able to effect massive social changes, men and women today can do the same. Indeed, the new means at our disposal give us immeasurable advantages that they lacked. We also have the advantage that in many places, democratic institutions do linger within the sinews of today's republican states. The commune lies hidden and distorted behind the city council. The section lies hidden and distorted in the neighbourhood and its community centres. The town meeting lies hidden and distorted in the township. The municipal confederations lie hidden and distorted in regional networks of towns and cities. By unearthing, renovating and building upon these hidden institutions, where they exist and building them where they do not, we can democratise the republic and expand the democracy to create the conditions for a degree of social freedom unprecedented in history. Radicalising the direct democracy would impart a political fulfilment to the institutions that the movement created, hence the slogan for this libertarian municipalist movement. Democratise the republic. Radicalise the democracy. Given the rapidity of technological and scientific change, the suddenness of social upheavals, and the certainty that capitalism's inherent imperative to growth must be finite, it is impossible to predict what social conditions and opportunities will exist even a generation from now. What is clear is that the demand for a rational society summons us to be rational beings, that is, to live up to our uniquely human potentialities and construct the commune of communes to fulfil our very humanity.